Chapter 3, by Local. When I was younger, it was, and to some extent it is still to this day, a fad to buy American. I recall that being one of the draws to Walmart when Sam Walton was running the company. Even in my early teens, Ross Perot talked about the giant sucking sound during his first presidential campaign. I even recall in my early 20s being upset that it was difficult to find cheap products that weren't labeled made in China. It didn't seem to matter to me that the products from other countries were made better. I was taught that outsourcing jobs was killing the American economy. Until my late 20s or early 30s, I never asked the question, why are companies outsourcing jobs? The simple answer is cheap labor. But why is the labor cheaper in other countries? Those who oppose a global economy like Perot say south of the border, you pay a dollar an hour for labor, have no health care. That's the most expensive single element in making a car. Have no environmental controls, no pollution controls, and no retirement, and you don't care about anything but making money there will be a giant sucking sound going south. I can sum up Perot's answer with the words regulations and taxes. The Competitive Enterprise Institute calculates that compliance with federal regulations cost Americans $1.863 trillion for 2013, and tax compliance costs an estimated $1 trillion annually, in addition to the taxes that are paid, according to the Mercatus Center. Put into perspective, compliance with taxes and regulations costs the average household $23,011 per year. The CEI reports this exceeds every item in the household budget except housing. More more than healthcare, food, transportation, entertainment, apparel, services, and savings. This explains a lot about why companies export jobs. But what of the people who are opposed to companies doing what companies are expected to do? Make a profit. I recently read a pair of articles that on the surface are only tangentially connected. However, after a little deep thought, I realized the authors are looking at the same problem from both a micro and macro level. Again, after some thought, I came up with the hypothesis People who are xenophobic have a flawed understanding of economics. Nikki Burgess from Students for Liberty writes, Let's begin with a basic economic principle. The more people an economy has, the more productive it can be. This appeals to common sense. Given equal circumstances, 20 people working will create more value than 10. For the sake of argument, it doesn't matter whether the 20 people live in one community or not. Those who oppose trade and or immigration will argue that there may not be enough work for 20 people and that some of the new people will work for less, thus putting some out of a job. While that may be true in the short term, it's not true in the long term. Burgess adds, economists agree that immigrants complement rather than compete with the native workforce. Even assuming the opposite, that migrants and natives do compete for the same work, the estimated net benefit to natives from migrant labor is still $22 billion annually. Besides, competition is good. It ensures that the most productive candidates are employed and it makes goods cheaper by driving down production costs. However, empirically, immigrants and natives do not usually pursue the same work. On the macro level, Brian Brenberg and Chris Horst write, History and research show that as trade increases, poverty decreases, and China is a prime example. Since 1978, when the country opened to foreign investment, China has grown to become the world's largest trader, measured by total imports and exports. The results have been striking. In 2012 alone, average factory wages in China rose 14%. In manufacturing specifically, worker wages have increased 71% since 2008. Over the last 30 years, Chinese families living in extreme poverty dropped from 84% to under 10%. Of course, China is just one example of the benefits of trade. A report released in 2011 by Yale University and the Brookings Institute found that the world's population living below the extreme poverty line plus plummeted from 52% to 15% in just 30 years from 1981 to 2011. Globalization and the spread of freer markets were credited with enabling the developing world to begin converging on advanced economy incomes after centuries of divergence. Aside from being bad economics, xenophobia is also irrational. Advocates of buy local use slogans like don't buy from strangers, buy from neighbors. This may make people in small towns feel good when they buy from the mom and pop stores. However, one needs to look deeper. Chances are the products in the mom and pop store were brought in from somewhere, which means there was most likely trade with someone outside the community, i.e., a stranger. This is not a bad thing. The numbers don't lie. When trade happens, wealth spreads, and when wealth spreads, everybody wins by becoming less poor.